uh, our next speaker is Wade Harper, who's from the Department of Pathology at Harvard Medical School. And Wade is going to tell us about proteomic and genetic analysis of ubiquitin-like protein conjugation systems. Wade. Uh, so first, I'd like to thank Arnie for the invitation to come and give you a um, summary of some of our recent work. So most of what you're going to be hearing today is systems biology. And I think this, my talk is going to deviate a little bit from that in that it's um, hopefully more systematic biology as opposed to systems biology. It's on a much smaller scale than many of the talks that you'll be hearing. Um, so the work I'm going to tell you about was done by um, three postdocs in the lab, Matt Soa, Eric Bennett, and Chris Behrens. And we've had a great collaboration with Steve Gigi's lab. In particular, he's allowed these guys to uh, come and co-opt as mass spectrometers, which has made it possible for, for us to do the experiments I'm going to tell you about. So the story I'm going to tell you about actually starts several years ago with an attempt by uh, my colleagues Steve Elledge and Greg Hannon and my lab to try to use RNAi approaches to interrogate cell cycle regulatory pathways and DNA damage control pathways in mammalian cells. And so as you all know, RNAi has become a useful tool to try to identify genes that are involved in different pathways. And we've been utilizing two different types of platforms, array-based screens and barcode-based screens to interrogate different pathways. Uh, some of this has been published. We've identified genes involved in the spindle checkpoint, also genes involved in cell proliferation. And these two studies focused on uh, classes of genes that we're most interested in, protein kinases and genes in the ubiquitin system. More recently, we've expanded into genome-wide approaches, uh, including recent synthetic lethal screens with campothecin, and also genome-wide screens to identify uh, proteins that control turnover of regulatory machinery that functions in DNA replication. Um, so these studies are, are real, RNAi studies in general can be extremely useful for identifying um, regulatory genes. But what we found, and what I think a lot of others are finding, is that when you, you do an RNAi screen, you get a lot of hits, uh, many of which you can validate. And then you validate them, but you have no clue what the gene function is. So what we were really interested in trying to do is generate sort of an orthogonal approach that would allow us to more rapidly understand the functions of novel or understudied genes that emerge from screens such as these, where you generally might get one or two, three, four hundred hits from, from such a screen. So what we've been working on then is a way to merge um, sort of genetic analysis through RNAi with proteomics so that we can identify candidate interacting proteins, uh, develop biochemical networks, and then feed new candidate interacting proteins that emerge from candidate uh, genes from RNAi screens back into an RNAi type approach. So one can use this type of approach not only to look for um, genes that emerge from screens, but also to look at pathways and gene families. So the idea would be if you had an interesting pathway or an interesting gene family, you can initially employ proteomics, identify new components, and carry out uh, RNAi screens based on, on that uh, kind of approach. So in the last few years, we've worked to develop a platform that allows us to do facile types of proteomic analysis. And so what this platform involves is uh, a collection of open reading frames, in particular the Vidal open reading frame collection, um, which we can then use to generate either focus networks or protein family collections uh, using gateway cloning technology and retroviral transduction technology that then allows us to create tagged cell lines that we can use for not only functional studies, but also for proteomic studies, wherein we take an HA tagged protein expressed off a retrovirus, IP that protein, and then submit it, the, basically the entire um, complex, to um, mass spectrometry. So uh, this gives you lots of proteins, and that brings up certain issues, and I'll talk about those in just a second. Uh, but let's say that you're able to process 
uh, this material, you can get known and potentially novel interacting proteins, build networks that generates new components for RNAi, and together with the Elgin uh, Hannon SHRNA uh, consortium, we're able to uh, then interrogate uh, in these new genes to find out um, what, if they're involved in a particular pathway, and then we can put these components back into the system and expand the network, essentially. So there's a major problem with um, trying to do this kind of analysis in any kind of scale. Um, so the, the problem comes about by trying to determine what's real and what's a false positive. It turns out that the vast majority of the proteins that are identified in this type of IP mass spec experiment are uh, false positives that simply interact with the resin. Uh, but it's actually more complicated than that because the bait, um, the identity of the bait can actually influence to some extent uh, what the types of false positives are in the, in the uh, particular IP. So this brings up the question of how do you go about trying to increase the scale so that one can actually try to approach an analysis of tens to dozens of proteins in a, uh, a, in a feasible manner with, say, uh, you know, not a huge number of people uh, and not a huge number of, of resources being expended for that. So just look at, in terms of the scale and complexity of the of proteomic and network analysis that's being done, uh, there's near proteome-wide analysis of interactions in yeast, um, in budding yeast, and roughly 45 proteins were done. So this is the extreme where a large number of proteins are done. The typical case is that labs will do a single protein or a small number of proteins. Um, and then what we're interested in doing is expanding the situation to where you can do tens or dozens of proteins, maybe in a focused manner. Now, again, uh, trying to understand what's real positives and what's false positives in this kind of data set is, is complicated. Now, if you have a relatively um, uh, large data set where there's a lot of interconnectivity, let's say you're, it's a highly reciprocal set of baits, uh, you can use uh, tools that were developed for the yeast uh, system, which involve protein enrichment scores and different learning algorithms that help you determine what's real and what's not real based on how many times you get reciprocal interaction or not. So the, the problem with this approach in applying it to small data sets is that um, you, know, you require a large number of reciprocal interactions. And in addition to have the learning algorithms work, you need to have a certain uh, set of gold standards. And what we're learning now is actually gold standards that people often use aren't necessarily gold standards. So that, that sort of brings up the question, how do you choose what the gold standards actually are? On the other extreme is a situation where you're only analyzing one or two baits. Here, you, most frequently, people use subtractive analysis. Um, this requires independent controls for each uh, component. Um, also, you have to, um, uh, the situation where if you identify a protein in your, in your control, then you have an absolute removal if it's found from your actual test case. So uh, this is a huge advantage when you're looking at protein, looking for proteins that actually do appear at some frequency with in control IPs. And so what we ended up doing was um, adding uh, or developing a software platform um, that helps get around a lot of these problems. So the, the uh, platform is called Compass for Comparative Proteomic Analysis Software Suite. And it has two major components. It's got a computational uh, component here, which is mainly a number crunching uh, set of algorithms that uh, take in the number of peptide scans that emerge from each particular protein in each particular bait and, try, and establishes three different uh, scores, a z-score, a d-score, a and a, a p-value associated with the d-score. And so we can use this, uh, these set of algorithms to give us a really um, good indication of what's a real positive versus what's a false positive in the data set. And I'll explain that just a little bit more detail in a second. Now, in addition, this system has a number of bioinformatic components that really aid in understanding um, what you've got in your particular mass spec experiment. So it has network tools, 
uh, protein domain analysis tools, uh, protein modification tools, et cetera. And so uh, this provides a really nice platform for taking um, tens to dozens, even into hundreds of proteins, putting them through the system, identifying what's likely to be um, a true positive, and then going on and doing further studies. And so the D-score has really turned out to be an important component in this. And the D-score is based on the uniqueness of a particular protein across dozens of IPs. Um, the number of spectral counts that are, that's identified for a particular pep, uh, protein, and then the reproducibility. Do, do you actually get the same result uh, in two separate experiments? Because it turns out much of the noise in uh, this kind of protein, um, uh, proteomic data is actually stochastic noise developed by a small number of peptides for proteins that appear in uh, certain runs but not in other runs. And so figuring out if those are true positives is, is really the problem here. And so our, our methodology uh, gets away with that, or gets by that problem. And it has several different features. It's completely unbiased. It doesn't require learning algor algorithms or anything like that. It doesn't require a gold standard data set. Uh, it doesn't require reciprocal uh, baits necessarily, uh, although of course this improves things. And it doesn't uh, require individual controls because every IP in the large data set is a control for every other IP. Okay, so this is an example of how it works. This is one of my favorite uh, proteins, protein complexes, the Cullen SCF ubiquitin ligase complex, which we've been working on for uh, a while now. So if you just um, look at the architecture of this complex, it's got a Cullen protein that it interacts with a variety of adapter proteins called F-box proteins that are here. Um, and it interacts through this adapter protein skip one. If you just do an Cull1 IP and you, uh, and you basically rank proteins based on the total spectral counts that you get, you see a long list of proteins. We typically identify 400 proteins in a, in a typical IP. Um, there's many proteins here that are in yellow. You can maybe barely see these guys here. They're way down the list uh, based on total spectral counts, but these are actually F-box proteins. And so if you pass this data set through the compass metric, essentially all the co uh, components that you see in yellow here are actually these F-box proteins that we know interact with the Cullen complex, and they almost all pass the D-score. So the D-score is able to stratify real positives versus false positives to a great degree, although there are some cases where real positives don't actually quite reach the cutoff. So what you can imagine is if you have a completely unstudied protein and you want to know what it does and you apply this kind of approach, uh, initially you, your data set might give you a long list of proteins. If you apply compass, you get an uh, enrichment in things that we call high confidence interacting proteins. Um, so we've been using this method a lot lately um, in different scenarios. Uh, and the initial system that we did, and in fact this is how uh, the system that we used to develop Compass in the first place, was on ubiquitin pathway components where we did an analysis of de ubiquitinating enzymes, which is a class of enzymes that removes ubiquitin from other kinds of proteins. And so we were able to do 75 proteins here and identify networks of different sorts that I don't have time to go into. We've applied this to proteins identified in RNAi screens, uh, identifying components in, particularly in the DNA repair pathway, and also proteins identified in phospho phosphoproteomic screens, including identification of a holiday junction resolvase that's required for DNA repair. And in total, so far, we've done about 500 proteins using this system, and it works really well. Um, for this kind of analysis. And one of the key features here is a, a single person can do dozens of proteins in a matter of a month or two or three, depending on availability of clone reagents. So it's possible to, to pretty rapidly generate data sets that can give you some biological information. So um, the, the, the challenge now then is to use this methodology to help elucidate uh, various uh, questions in different areas. So there's a relationship between the genetic and the physical interactions. What did the, does the gen genetic system tell us that the proteomic system uh, also tells us and vice versa? Uh, can we detect weak interactions, for example, between enzymes and their substrates, be them uh, de enzymes, protein kinases, things like that? 
Uh, there's also interrogation of pathways through phosphorylation and other kinds of modifications where one can in initiate a cascade and monitor changes that occur in that network, uh, either uh, based on the overall organization of the proteins in complexes or also their, their modification state. Uh, you also have the relationship with the, between the proteome and the metabolome, which is becoming ever more uh, important as we try to elucidate how cancer is really emerging. And then there's also the question of lineage specificity, how different cells utilize the same machinery to carry out either similar or different tasks. So what I'm going to do in the, for the bulk of the talk then is tell you about our efforts to understand uh, dynamically and, and from a pathway point of view a, a particularly interesting system that involves ubiquitin-like protein conjugation, and that is the aut autophagy system. So what I'm going to tell you about is our efforts to understand the organization of the uh, autophagy system. So as you know, uh, protein homeostasis is a really critical, plays a really critical role in uh, many aspects of cell biology. Uh, the ubiquitin system is primarily involved in the turnover of regulatory proteins through an E1, E2, E3 cascade, whereby ubiquitin gets attached to proteins, it gets uh, recruited to the proteasome, and the protein gets uh, degraded, um, leading to activation or inhibition of a particular process. In most cases, the half-lives of proteins that go through the ubiquitin system are on the minutes to, to less than an hour sort of time scale. The autophagy system is actually something that's quite different in design from the ubiquitin system, but nevertheless controls protein homeostasis. So it often uh, is thought to control the abundance of very stable proteins. Uh, it controls the abundance of organelles, especially damaged organelles such as mitochondria, and also is thought to be responsible for degrading aggregated proteins that might emerge in various situations. So these different components are captured by something called an autophagosome, which I'll go into in just a minute, and these are then delivered into the lysosome where amino acids are produced ultimately and small peptides as well. And the, the key point here is that the components that are being degraded have half-lives in the hours to days kind of time frame. So autophagy has been implicated in a number of different human diseases. Uh, there's an involvement potentially in neuroprotection, whereby aggregates that, that occur in, in neurons are degraded through the pathway. Uh, it's involved in, in uh, cancer through uh, potentially multiple roles, but um, in particular, the Becklin protein has been identified as a candidate tumor suppressor. It's involved in muscle wasting, aging. Uh, pathogens often use the autophagy system to, uh, to get into cells and to also tr try to co-opt it, and in some cases, the autophagy system is used to get rid of pathogens. It's also involved in MHC class II antigen presentation. Um, and interestingly, if, if uh, in mice, for example, that don't have autophagy, they have problems in neonate survival because that's, there's a period of time where you need this extra boost of, uh, of, um, of uh, basically the building blocks of, of a protein synthesis, et cetera, uh, to get you through the stage where you don't have very many nutrients. And then apoptotic cell engulfment. So there's a lot of different aspects to autophagy, but one of the most interesting ones is its relationship to cancer. And I've taken uh, this slide from Eileen White, who's actually here, who has been a leader in trying to understand the relationship between autophagy and cancer. And so here's the view of, of the situation where a cell is basically under metabolic stress, and if apoptosis and autophagy functions are active, then that stress can potentially lead to cell death. And so that's, in the cancer case, that's an important uh, component. If autophagy is defective, but, but, a, um, uh, but apoptosis is still active, then a metabolic stress can still lead to accelerated, or to apoptosis, um, and in fact, it can potentially be accelerated due to the absence of autophagy. Now, this is a really interesting situation here where if apoptosis is inhibited, for example, by expression of BCL2 or something like that, and a cell experiences meta metabolic stress, autophagy can uh, allow the cell to survive for perhaps longer than it normally would. Cells eat their contents, essentially, 
uh, to produce a, a, a cell that's basically in the preservation phase. And if that cell then receives subsequently some nutrients, it can then re-expand and re-proliferate. Um, and then, of course, if you have defective autophagy and apoptosis, you can have a, ne a necrotic event. So, um, so there's sort of several ways to think about autophagy working in a cancer situation. So let's say you have a normal epithelium, there's a cancer initiation event, uh, you have proliferation and, and apoptosis, and eventually the apoptosis uh, uh, pathway becomes inhibited and you have a, a tumor uh, growth. Now, there's a certain step here where you, the cells might become low in nutrients. So cells at the center of a tumor mass, for example, might induce autophagy. That might allow these guys to survive longer uh, in, in the actual in, in situ environment. And over time, this might allow for uh, vasculature uh, to, to emerge, and then ultimately a tumor can grow out. So in the case of Becklin-1 mutations, it's a heterozygous uh, tumor suppressor protein, it's thought that these proteins, uh, these cells that lack Becklin uh, may actually um, become ne sort of necrotic, and that leads to DNA damage uh, in the, in the uh, tumor environment and ultimately leads to a situation where you get inflammation, angiogenesis, and ultimately tumor, tumor progression. So that's sort of how Becklin is thought to be involved in, in uh, tumor genesis. So we're interested in trying to understand molecularly what this whole pathway looks like. Can we understand the signaling that's involved, et cetera, uh, and then potentially can we identify uh, targets for therapeutics that might be able to block this the step that allows uh, cells to survive in a tumor situation. Now work from uh, Asumi um, in yeast primarily has revealed the molecular architecture of the autophagy system in budding yeast. So here's the sort of general pathway for how this works. You have something called an isolation membrane, which is a double lipid bilayer membrane that grows in response to signaling pathways, and it grows in a certain way and encapsulates uh, cellular or cytoplasmic proteins and organelles, uh, encapsulates them in this vesicle and delivers them to the lysosome where they're then degraded in the sort of in the autolysosome. And there's four major signaling networks that are involved in this pathway. There's uh, regulation of induction, which occurs by a protein kinase complex, which is called ATG1 in yeast. Uh, and this complex is under control of the TOR pathway. So if you add rapamycin, it actually will activate uh, the system by allowing um, this regulatory subunit, ATG13, to load onto the ATG1 kinase, and that promotes autophagy. It also has an autophagosome nucleation step where a PI3 kinase complex composed of a, a VS, BPS34 protein and also uh, things like Becklin are in this complex as well. So they phosphorylate um, uh, these, these phosphoinositides, which mark the membrane that's going to end up being the autophagosome. Uh, so this is a critical step to marking the right lipids. And then there is a ubiquitin-like uh, protein conjugation system, which is actually why we sort of got interested in this in the first place. It, it involves an E1 enzyme, uh, ATG7, that charges uh, two different types of ubiquitin-like proteins, ATG12 and, a and ATG8, uh, and then uh, basically conjugates uh, these proteins to either a protein in the case of ATG12, it gets conjugated to ATG5, or in the case of ATG8, it gets conjugated to a phosphoethanolamine and gets inserted um, into the lipid bilayer and basically marks the growing autophagosome. And then finally, there's a sort of membrane retrieval complex that also has a PI3 uh, phosphate binding module associated with it that's involved in, in recycling components as the growing membrane is being formed. So there's lots of questions that are uh, um, still unanswered, especially in the mammalian system. And so these include what are the inputs into these regulatory pathways, what's upstream, what's downstream, what are the substrates of these kinases, et cetera. We don't really understand fully how this quote unquote E3 works, this conjugate here that forms between HG5 and HG12. It's somehow enhancing 
lipidation of ATG8 and helping it get into the membrane. Um, and we don't understand crosstalk between these different modules. How do they work together uh, um, and where do the signals go between them? So we thought this, this would be a, a really good situation to use the proteomic approach. And it's actually even made more interesting by the fact that in mammalian cells, the machinery is more complicated than in yeast. So there's components here that where there's a single gene in yeast, there's six genes in mammalian cells, or, or two genes in the case of HEG16, four genes in the case of HEG4, et cetera. And we don't know, uh, you know to what extent these proteins are redundant, whether they play specific roles in the pathway, or, or, or whether, um, you know, exactly what's going on with respect to the divergence of this uh, gene family, these sets of gene families. So uh, what Chris Behrens in the lab did was, again, use the COMPASS system, basically, to develop an interaction network for uh, the autophagy system. He took 32 primary baits from not only the autophagy system itself, but also some sort of peripheral components, some uh, vesicle uh, control proteins, et cetera. Um, and they did proteomics on those, got candidate interacting proteins, and from those he created 33 more uh, baits. And so in total, the network that we have has about 65 proteins uh, that were analyzed through the COMPASS platform. So this is what the data look like if you look at it on a clustering diagram. And so this is all the raw data. We identified about 2,500 proteins in the 65 mass spec runs. If you then pass this through COMPASS, you get rid of all these lines here, which represent false positives that are present in many uh, of the different IPs, and you get uh, a pretty clean set of, of uh, connectivities between different components. And you can sort of see what these sort of look like. This is the Becklin PI3 kinase complex. This is the AMPK complex. This is parts of the uh, ATG conjugation system, et cetera. So you, you can sort of see how the data looks from that point of view. Now, if you look at it from uh, sort of an interactome point of view, it's actually quite complicated. So uh, the, this is displayed in a manner where each of these different colors represents a sub-network in the, in the whole pathway. So you have here, for example, the ULK, ULK1 kinase network. So this is the ATG1 network, the PI3 kinase complex, et cetera. And so overall, you can see there's a lot of connectivity between the different subunits. And if you uh, sort of look complex by complex, you can deduce that there's something on the order of 22 subnetwork interactions. So that's sort of telling us something about how many of these different components might touch each other at some point in this pathway. And we had something on the order of 450 previously un unidentified interactions in this data set. So this is just giving you a bird, bird's eye view of uh, a couple of these different complexes the uh, HG8, HG12 network, the Becklin network, and the uh, ULK1 kinase network. And I'll just point out a couple of interesting features for these. So in this particular case, we identified uh, the components of a membrane tethering complex, which is interesting given that the function of this complex here, the ATG12 network, is to help put ATG8 conjugates into the lipid uh, bilayer. So that's potentially a relevant type of interaction. Uh, this is a case where there's a ubiquitin ligase, the AMBRA DDB1 col 4 DDA complex associated with a Becklin complex as well as ATG14, which we identified uh, through this method. And then uh, with ULK1, there's both a regulatory complex composed of these three proteins, which several labs have recently reported, and also we identified AMPK, uh, as, which is um, a protein kinase that's activated by AMP. And this is um, interacting with ULK1 and ULK2, and data from our lab and other labs is now showing that this AMPK complex is responsible for phosphorylation and activation of the ULK1 uh, and ULK2 proteins. So this potentially provides a way for cells to sense AMP, AMP levels, energy levels in essence, and turn on autophagy. So in total, we had something on the order of 68% reciprocal IP mass spec validation rates, uh, 27 of the interactions seen between 19 yeast autophagy proteins. Um, of, of these 27, we found 23 occur in, in the, the mammalian system. And there's numerous uh, new and candidate regulatory components 
these systems that we uh, haven't yet had a chance to look into. So what I want to spend the last part of the talk talking about is the ATG8 subnetwork, which is composed of these uh, six different proteins in humans, the GABA wraps and the LC3s that are uh, sort of orthologous to ATG8 in yeast. So what does ATG8 do? Well, ATG8 is this protein that gets embedded into the, uh, phos in, into the lipid bilayer and serves to organize the autophagosome and to mark it as an autophagosome. And it's thought that ATG8 could be doing multiple different things. It could be uh, bringing in cargo uh, into the autophagosome. Uh, ATG8 not only is on the outside, but also on the inside. And so you can imagine ATG8 binding to uh, proteins through this motif that I'll tell you about in a little bit more detail later called the Lear motif or LC3 interacting region. Uh, and those proteins might have associated with them cargo binding sites. And so cargo is then bound to this component and brought into the autophagosome. And there's the three major cargo proteins, or, or uh, cargo binding proteins that have been studied. The sequestosome, also called P62, MBR1, and NIX. These two proteins have a UB8 domain, and they're thought to bind to ubiquitinated proteins and bring those into the autophagosome. So this could be, for example, aggregated, aggregated proteins. And then NIX uh, interacts with mitochondria, and it's thought to be the protein responsible for targeting mitochondria into the autophagosome. So we don't know much about uh, what the various cargo adapters are for autophagy. Uh, many different uh, cellular components can be selectively taken up by the autophagy system. Uh, we don't know whether there's regulatory proteins that bind to HG8 that, to help it form the autophagosome, help it curve and, to, and, and expand. And we don't understand what these different ATG8 orthologs, the GABA wraps and the LC3s, are actually doing and why they might be six genes for this process. So it turns out that if you look at the crosstalk between the proteomic data for the LC3 proteins and also the GABA wrap proteins, there's a high degree of uh, interaction between the various components. So at first glance, you would think that these guys uh, are playing potentially similar roles in that they seem to bind to the same cohorts of proteins, or at least to a large degree. Um, now, if you look at this, it seems like, well, maybe there's some proteins that might be specific. As I'll show you later, it turns out that this is probably just a deficit in the mass specs ability to see these guys under certain conditions. These actually do bind to other proteins in the network, other LC3 or GABARAP proteins, um, if you test them directly. So what's in this particular uh, network? First, we have the components in the conjugation apparatus. So basically, all of these come through this, the analysis. Um, in addition, we have the cargo proteins, MBR1, sequestrosome, that are involved in uh, recruiting ubiquitinated proteins. There is a number of RAB GTPase regulators. These are proteins that are known to be involved in vesicle fusion events. And so there's potential for these guys to be involved somehow in forming and helping shape the autophagosome. There is ubiquitination components, which is interesting, potentially uh, implicating regulation of ubiquitination on the surface of the autophagosome. Uh, there's two proteins that interact with uh, PI3P, which uh, potentially are involved in, again, recognizing the um, special phospholipid on, on these uh, particular autophagosomes and uh, causing changes in dynamics or some other aspect of the pathway. And then there's also other subnetworks, uh, subunits of other subnetworks here. So the ULK1 kinase network, the PI3 kinase complex, and the ATG2. Uh, complex here. So um, in total, across the whole ATG8 uh, network, we have about 52% of the proteins that have uh, gene ontology descriptors that link them to vesicle and membrane function, ubiquitin protein trafficking, or signal transduction. So uh, many of the proteins that are here actually seem to be enriched in, in things you might expect for this type of pathway. So we went on to do some validation and some sort of a test of how specific these, these interactions actually are. So this is just a description of the type of interactions that we get. Uh, in this particular case, we're using in vitro translated proteins, uh, interacting proteins, and we're doing GST pulldowns in vitro with the five HEG8 uh, proteins. 
And so overall, there's 145 interactions that were tested, and 88% of them validate. And, and what this data also showed us that I don't really have time to go into is that we can see interactions uh, between various components here that aren't necessarily represented by the direct proteomic data. So it's as though um, perhaps the proteomic data wasn't sufficient to get low abundance interactions, but you can see it when you directly test uh, the interaction. So the next question is, what about the requirement for the Lear motif? So what is the Lear motif and how does it work? So the Lear motif is the LC3 interaction region, and that is a sequence in proteins like P62 or MBR1, the ubiquitin cargo proteins I told you about. It's just a simple hydrophobic motif. There's not much to it. But what that does is bind to a hydrophobic surface on the ATG8 protein, shown here in green. So you have the Lear in blue, the uh, ATG8 protein in green. And so we were interested in determining, um, among all the different interactors, which ones require this interaction motif to allow for assembly of the network, essentially. And so we chose two different uh, ATG8 proteins, GABARAP and uh, LC3B, and mutated the two residues that formed a hydrophobic pocket where this Lear motif binds, and simply asked, do they still bind to the interacting protein or not? So overall, we found that 60% of the proteins in the network that we tested uh, require the Lear motif to, to bind to GABARAP, and about 35% require it to bind to LC3. Um, so this is a reasonable uh, extent of requirement for the Lear motif. We know that a lot of proteins um, that have been shown before use that motif. But this also suggests that perhaps there's other surfaces on ATG8 that will allow association with either cargo or regulators. And so um, one can imagine a couple of different scenarios. Either an ATG8 protein binds specifically to one Lear motif protein and then that is basically all that ATG protein is going to do. Or you can imagine multiple surfaces on the ATG8 protein functioning to generate a signaling network involving multiple interacting proteins on the same ATG8 molecule. And we don't really know at this point uh, which one of those two possibilities is going to dominate the data set. So um, the other thing that ATG8 proteins do is they get conjugated to uh, to lipids, and that requires a C-terminal glycine residue on the ATG8 protein. If you delete this residue, then you can't get uh, phosphatidylethanolamine conjugated to ATG8. You can't get integration into the, into the bilayer. So we did proteomics on these different proteins lacking this glycine, and basically tried to compare um, the situation with uh, wild type uh, using sort of a uh, label-free, semi-quantitative proteomic analysis that I don't have time to go into. So in essence, what we found is there's a number of proteins that remain associated with ATG8 in the absence of a C-terminal glycine. So these guys are able to uh, interact independent of the glycine or potentially incorporation into a lipid. In contrast, uh, there's a number of proteins who um, who lose binding when you delete the glycine. Now, two of these actually turn out to be components of the conjugation system, and they give a really dramatic phenotype. So ATG7 and ATG3 are the E1 and E2 enzymes that function in conjugation, and they require that glycine residue to activate uh, the, the conjugation system. And if you remove the glycine, you get a complete loss from going from 100 peptides identified by mass spec to basically one or two peptides identified. So it's a massive loss of, of binding. Um, nevertheless, there's a number of other proteins that display a similar loss of binding. So you have two different classes, right? You have some proteins that remain bound and some proteins that um, require the glycine. And this is sort of interesting if you look at two different proteins here, uh, a protein called GBAS and, and the P62 protein. With the LC3 components, they remain bound, but with the, um, the GABARAPs, they're lost. So that's one way that the GABARAPs and the LC3 proteins are different, whereas in most cases they appear to be very similar. So then we went on to test, well, what happens if you activate the pathway by um, inhibition of TOR? So in this particular experiment, we're comparing proteomic analysis of these different baits uh, using uh, 
with and without basically addition of the TORIN-1 inhibitor of TOR. And so, interestingly, to a large degree, the core signaling components that you see here, the ATG516 network, the, the Becklin network, et cetera, they don't really change a lot in the presence of TORIN. You do see some, uh, perhaps, small increase in red when you um, activate with TORIN, potentially just um, suggesting that there's an enhancement of formation of these complexes. It's a little bit different situation when you look at HG8s. So there's a set of proteins that include the conjugation machinery that uh, basically either don't change or maybe slightly increase when you, when you activate uh, autophagy with taurin. And then there's a few proteins that include P62 and also GBAS that are frequently really lost uh, when you, when you uh, activate autophagy. And this is interesting because it's known that this sequestosome protein enters into the autophagosome and, and is degraded. So it's possible that some of these other proteins that behave similarly, where you lose interaction a lot in the presence of taurin, actually are being degraded. And so that's one of the things we're trying to sort out now, is how many of these proteins that are binding to HG8 are actually substrates for autophagy. Okay, so finally, um, what about genetics? What, is, what can we learn about the requirement for these different genes that we've identified? So Chris developed a, um, basically a, a 384 well plate assay looking at autophagosomes, and we use a confocal microscope, uh, uh, basically a high throughput confocal microsco microscope to grab images of cells across these different plates after transfection with different RNAIs. So this is sort of the situation that you have here, and hopefully you can see this from the back. So in untreated cells, there's basal autophagy going on. So you see these little dots here. Those are autophagosomes that are labeled by uh, LC3 uh, that's marked with GFP. If you add rapamycin, you see a, about a two to three-fold increase in the number of autophagosomes that occur. If you inhibit a component of the uh, ULK1 kinase complex, RB1CC1, uh, you block auto autophagy, so you essentially see no um, autophagosomes here. Uh, also, uh, in the presence of rapamycin, you can't overcome that. So in this situation, it's off. And then here's a particular siRNA to a particular protein that emerged from the, from the proteomics that causes an increase in the number of autophagosomes. So it's on, it increases the basal, and it also some, often increases above rapamycin um, in these particular kinds of experiments. So we took uh, 86 genes across the network and did RNAi. Um, with four SI, siRNAs to each gene, and we did it in the presence and absence of rapamycin, and we could develop um, basically a profile for the kinds of genes that get, gives hits. So we're, we're more confident about the stuff on the extremes because of, there's a substantial amount of off-target effects with these siRNAs. And so here in the, in the top part of the of this, uh, slide are genes that uh, basically act like rapamycin. They increase the number of autophagosomes in cells. And then there's a set of genes that, whose depletion blocks autophagosome formation, similar to the RB1CC1 subunit of the ULK1 complex I told you about. So if you look down here, there's a number of, of uh, proteins that we know something about. There's the PI3 kinase complex. There's UBLs that are involved, HG5, HG12, ULK1, et cetera. Um, there's also genes that haven't been implicated in autophagy uh, in a direct way by RNAi. That includes a, a protein kinase, a protein involved in GTPase control, and a component of a, a membrane tethering complex. And so these are just examples of new proteins that emerge that block autophagy when you deplete them. And then there's a number of proteins that uh, behave in the opposite way. And so we're still trying to understand exactly what these guys are doing. But uh, as a first attempt at that, we have so far tested several of these in flux assays, which is a measure of how rapid things are going through the autophagy system. It turns out about 15 genes we tested so far uh, activate flux, and three genes appear to contribute to fusion with the lysosome. So they can act at different stages um, in, in the pathway, and we're you know, going to be sorting through some of this. So in the end, you come up with this type of complex network where we're sort of here drawing interconnectivities between the different signaling modules and highlighting different uh, components of the complex and different 
information that's known about the domains and the types of proteins that are in these networks. And suffice it to say that there's a huge amount still to be figured out about how these components are working together. One of the interesting things is that there's obviously a link between AMPK and ULK1, so potential link to energy uh, metabolism. There's a link between uh, this, the conjugation system and a vesicle tethering complex. And interestingly, one of the genes that emerged from this uh, study is orthologous to uh, TRS-85, which is required for autophagy and yeast. There is orthologs of this uh, yeast protein complex here, MON-CCZ1, which is involved in regulating um, uh, autophagy and yeast, but, and recently shown to be required for apoptotic uh, cell phagocytosis in uh, C. elegans. So this is a really interesting complex here. And then uh, this protein WDR45 is a likely ortholog of ATG18. And as I m mentioned, there's a lot of uh, crosstalk between these different components. Ultimately, you know, are there candidates for cancer drugs in this data set? There's uh, several, in addition to the, to the regular lipid kinase, there's additional lipid kinases in, in the network. There's protein kinases in the network, GTPase regulators, deubiquitinating enzymes, ubiquitin ligases, and numerous protein interactions that potentially could be targeted. So the challenges for the future include trying to understand network dynamics, how things respond to autophagy activators and inhibitors, what changes in the network, what are the regulatory modifications that might be ongoing. Are there any new components that are better drug targets than the sort of canonical components, which ATG7, uh, VPS34, the PI3 kinase comp component, and ULK1 are currently being looked at by various uh, pharmaceutical companies. What does ATG8 network tell us about cargo recruitment and how autophagosome formation and lysosomal fusion is regulated? And are there other components in this network that might be mutated in cancer? One of the interesting components that emerged from the network is the HIPPO pathway, which is mutated at least in liver cancer that I know about. So there's um, a lot to be sorted out with these different studies, but the methodology I think that we've developed is very useful for doing this kind of thing and can be used in the future to further uh, establish uh, how this system works. So I'll just stop there and thank uh, Matt Soa in the lab, Eric Bennett, and Chris Behrens. Chris is responsible for essentially all the autophagy work. Matt and Eric were the ones who developed the uh, COMPASS system and uh, analyzed the deubiquitinating enzymes. Uh, and I'll be happy to try and answer some questions. I think we have time for one question, maybe. So autophagy now, is it's more appreciated that it's probably specialized and different under different stress conditions. Yeah. For example, what, happened, the, what happens in starvation may be different from hypoxia, where you have the accumulation of damaged proteins and organelles. Are you considering or have you looked at how your interactome changes under different conditions? Because you've only looked at Torin 1. Yeah, so um, at this point, Torin 1's the only thing we've looked at. And of course, it would be very interesting to do this now with several different um, mechanisms of activation or of, of autophagy. Um, we haven't done starvation yet, um, but we've considered that. Um, I guess the question is, can we develop a way to look more specifically at what might be organelle-dependent uh, autophagy? And, you know, it'd be interesting to talk to you about what might be possible there. Well, uh, question, quick yeah. question. Uh, on many of the complex networks that you had um, with many interactions, there was a lack of uh, arrowheads. So this is more of a kind of a technical question. Um, do you have information about the, essentially, the direction of those edges and magnitudes of effects on those complicated networks? Yes. Uh, in, in every case, where there is, um, so th they're color coded in that if, if we had reciprocal IP, there was a different colored line going back. So, sorry, it probably went by too fast, but yeah, um, we have all the directionality within the data set that we have right now. We haven't done, obviously, a systematic reciprocal analysis. We've only done 33 uh, proteins from the network in a reciprocal manner. 
So, you know, we'll, we'll continue to do more to, to try and, val you know, have a higher quality data set. But as it stands now, we've, we've got about 68% overall uh, reciprocal interactions when we test directly. Thank you. Okay, I think we best move on. Thank you very much.